Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply. This video is to bring you a closer look at the SDC. This is the 1291 ADDMR1. Electric deadbolt is what it is. This is a fun piece of hardware. I don't get to sell these as often as I would like uh, because they're for a fairly unusual application. And what this is is an electric bolt. Um, you know, uh, electric deadbolt, I suppose. And it's pretty simple and straightforward, but what's really neat about this one is you're obviously going to have electric control over the bolt itself. This being fail secure, there's no power, so that bolt is in the secured position. Okay. But what I like about this version is that you can have mechanical key access from either side of the door. This client specifically, and I'll show you a little more information about his project, wanted a lock that's always locked but you know felt we felt it necessary to be able to come in should you need to get in let's say there's a power outage and this door is locked and it's a residential application the front door of the home there are other means by which to gain access to the house other than the front door but the client will be able to come in mechanically on the outside with his mortise cylinder he's going to have a mortise thumb turn on the inside so that he can retract the bolt in order to exit um, and he can electrically control this. He is powering this back to access control. That access control system, outside of the scope of what we're working on, uh, will allow him access via the app on his cell phone. He can remotely lock and unlock the door. It's really great. So in summary, this is an electric deadbolt that has a narrow back set, inch and three quarter. You can have key control over both sides or key and a thumb turn or key only, nothing on the outside if you want. You're obviously gonna be able to control this load, the bolt is called the load, with any switch that you want, a, a doorbell button, you know, a, a key switch. You can operate it with um, a keypad, you know, any sort of switch that can open and close the circuit to this item is going to be able to control this. Uh, other things can be added as well. You could have, um, you know, an enunciator installed so that you can hear a buzzing sound when it's unlocked. Uh, this is a auto relock switch that's here so that when the ball is extended, the latch bolt will stay retracted. So what happens is when the door closes, this ball will be depressed and it will then tell the, tell the solenoid uh, to let that to drop the um, current to the solenoid, allowing the bolt to project back out. So it won't relock. So if someone, you know, let's say you install this and we did this for a client who had, an architect's office, um, front door out to a major thoroughfare in Chicago. Um, I forget, you know, the the road, street, Broadway or Kedzie, some major thoroughfare, lots of traffic. Um, architect's office, that door is always secured. Inside is the vestibule, uh, then the secretary's office, and she wants to be able to hit that button to let people in after she's looked at the camera to know who's outside. Um, client opens the door. The door, is in, the door is ajar. You want that bolt to stay in until the door gets closed, until the auto relock says, okay to lock now, because it'll assume that it is then, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with this. Uh, very obviously, so that it's then obviously in alignment with the positioning on the strike. Okay, so that's what the auto relock ball does. Um, and then the way that the cylinder works is that simply the tailpiece on your mortise cylinder or the cam will be in here, and when you rotate it, you will. I'm lifting that, acting like it's the cam, retract your latch bolt in. This is in the Y finish. This client wanted black. This is black anodized aluminum faceplate. And again, is a fail secure model. Electrical profile, 12 or 24 volts. Um, the amount of amps that it will pull is directly related to the voltage. You'll notice that as the volts increases, the amps decrease because that's the basic formula E equals I times R. As E increases, obviously the volts need to decrease in order if the ohms are staying the same, which the ohms would, of course, always be the same on, you know, this solenoid here. So um, as you're designing your electrical circuit, you'll need to know how many amps 
your power supply needs to supply, and that's going to be based on what voltage you're going to wire the system at. Okay, so really beautiful uh, tool. I'm I'm an unabashed fan of SDC uh, because um, in 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 every every co every company does a good job with technical support, but SDC is 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 pretty pretty awesome. Every time I call them, there's a there's one gentleman there that I speak to mostly who just seems to answer the phone all the time. He's extremely helpful. We're on and off the phone in seconds, and I've got the correct answer that I need. So, uh, what else is included? The instructions. Well, this is the template. We're going to go over all of the documentation uh, necessary to get this all wired up. It's very simple and straightforward um, how to wire this. It will include the strike that I had shown you earlier. Uh, you know what? Let's back up. Let's do some dimensional properties. Overall length, about 10 and a half. Overall width, about an inch and a half. This again is an inch and three quarter back set. The edge of the door to the center of where the mortise cylinder would be is going to be inch and three quarter. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's inch and three quarter, but this is measuring at inch and seven eighths. We're going to have to call the factory on that to make sure that that's accurate. The underside of the plate to the center of the aluminum block is inch and three quarter. The outside of the plate is clearly inch and seven eighths. It's not inch and three quarter. I'm going to have to contact the factory on that. I'm wondering if that. Um, I'm wondering if we have a problem here. Uh, either this is an error, or it's actually one and seven eighths back set. So I am going to clarify that with the factory, and I will and I will advise. Uh, I will I will add that to the extended description of this uh, video. Um, overall height of the strike, 4 inch, inch and a half width, thickness is you know, probably an eighth of an inch. Well, it, well, it's going to be an eighth of an inch on the faceplate because that's what it appears to be that our back set is off. The thickness of the plate is 1.21 inch, so basically an eighth of an inch. You're also going to get with all of this um, mounting tabs couple of pieces of aluminum that have been drilled and tapped where you can drill and dr uh, drill and countersink into your door top and bottom get the mounting tabs installed so that you can then screw the body to the edge of the door um, also uh, there are only two uh, so you they don't give you anything for the strike um, in terms of mounting tabs so you'll need to come up with some some way of mounting this and my client with his custom metal door and frame, they're taking into account. Actually, I think I sold them a couple of Adams Wright um, flat style mounting tabs is what we did. Then finally, you're going to have a wiring harness that's going to go with the wiring harness that's here. Okay. The auto relock is there. Um, there is information here that tells you how to wire it based on the voltage. Now we're going to go over that in detail, so I won't beleaguer that point here. This is going to connect, obviously, and run back to your power supply and then run to your switch, uh, depending on how you wire these. Two are going to go in one direction, two will go in the other direction. Okay, um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Let's switch now to the screen view and let's take a closer look at the supporting information. If you are enjoying this video, please click thumbs up or like, and also please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's move on to the rest of the video. Here is the item that we are looking at, and let's take a look at some images that we have pulled up. Here's the lock body here. Or I should say, forgive me, the box, the label. The contents. The faceplate, what you see from the edge of the door. Speaking of from the edge of the door, here's the email that I have into the factory about this quandary um, over the edge uh, back set dimension. I've, I've asked them what is that dimension 
and this is what it's measuring from the edge of the door. So it's something's not right here. Um, it could be how they machined and milled these aluminum uh, brackets are simply um, incorrect is what is what it's likely going to turn out to be. Um, you know, or all of their data that says inch and seven eighths back set is simply out of date. We'll discover what it is. The reason it's important is for this client, this is the second one this client purchased. So they've got the one that was sent to the job site for the, uh, there are two openings actually. We sent one to the job site in the finish that was immediately available, a stainless or a aluminum finish. I forget what it is. The client then ordered the second special order in black and then he ordered a Replay, then he ordered a spare faceplate in black and then a spare strike plate in black so that he would have everything that would match. Um, so that's why I really I need to know because the client's got a couple of very custom doors that either have the hole in the right location or in the wrong location. Meaning I don't know what was sent out to him initially. Was it inch and three quarter or inch and seven eighths? And uh, I want to discover uh, immediately if the factory has made an error on this or if for some reason this does match what the client was already sent, sent, and it's just a matter of their paperwork being out of date because they would not measure the back set from the underside of the faceplate. That would be from the edge of the door. In fact, back set is actually measured. Like this. Please imagine that this is a square edge door. That's pretty awful. You've got a square edge door, you've got a radius door, you've got a rabbited door, and then you have a beveled edge door. Back set is always measured from the center of the thickness of the door. Okay, what that means is this dimension to the center line is inch and three quarter. So if you measure here to the center line, it's fine. If you measure here to the, to the center line, it's not fine. Or if you measure here to the center line, it's not fine. Okay, so they define it based on the center of the thickness, which makes it uh, easy to understand that your back set is the same regardless of how thick the door is when you have a beveled edge door. Okay, that's the aluminum block assembly that is holding uh, the cylinders in, showing the middle of the body assembly and then the end. Let's go to the next set of images that I have pulled up here. This is the slider that is machined. The, these two aluminum pieces are machined for this slide block, this T-shaped slide block to move when the key is turned or the thumb turn in this case is turned, that cam will sit inside of here and drive that aluminum piece up, pulling the solenoid along with it, which of course is linked to the bolt. There's a better look at it all. And there are a couple of very small holes that you can get a long set screw uh, Allen wrench down in to tighten those holes that are there. The label on the on the uh, unit, you'll notice that this is double this, and this is half of that because as this increases, this decreases. This is how you're going to connect the wires coming off of this based on how you're going to power it. There are indeed. Uh, there are five wires actually. Let's take a look. We'll discuss when we get to the wiring diagram what that fifth wire is for. Um, well, I mean, we know what it's for. It's it's going to, you know, you're going to power the unit. Then your mounting tabs than that wiring harness showing those five wires. Okay. Now let's switch to, here's the item we're working on, not much to see here. Let's now get over to the cut sheet. And let's dive into the overview of this series of locks. We've got a couple of part numbers up here and SDC does a really good job at keeping everything simple and organized. So let's just jump down and dispel what you know these part numbers mean and I happen to know they're right here so you have jam mount and door mount. You've got a 1091 series and a 1291 series. As you study these part numbers, you'll see 1091 is fail safe, 
1291 is fail secure, and that continues on. 1091, fail safe, 1091, fail safe, 12, fail secure, 12, fail secure. Okay, now we figured it out. Pick one or the other based on the function. Do you want the lock always locked when there is no power? That's fail secure. When you take it out of the box, it'll be in the locked condition when there's no power. If you want to continuously power the unit, and then when the power is removed, um, forgive me, let me back up. If you want to continuously power the unit to have it locked, and then when the power drops out or the circuit is opened, it's unlocked, that's fail safe. So the question is, what state do you want the lock to be in when, it's, when there is no power? Do you want it locked or unlocked? If you want it locked, it's fail secure. If you want it unlocked, it's fail safe. So then you just pick which, what you need. So now you're down to half of these. Is it door or jam mounted? Ours is door mounted. Now, all we have to do here is figure out, is it a single mechanical release or a double mechanical, pardon me, a double mechanical release? Meaning, do you want to have access on one side or both sides of the door um, for this application? Our client needed a thumb turn on the inside, so we clearly went with a double mechanical fail secure, which makes it this part number. Now, you'll also notice that they have a narrower back set when it's jam mounted, okay? That's the edge of the door, edge of the jam to the center of the hole. Uh, and that's pretty nice because it will allow you to install a lock into your frame that has key control. Um, you know, when you, when you think that through a little bit, if you're going to install the lock in your jam, um, you might, you're going to need to think about where you're going to install all of that. Um, I was doing a different project with a client at the same time as this client basically and they were trying to figure out how to get this all to work and your door is here all right the problem with this other clients project so so the jam mounted bolt is going to be here right okay so whatever the distance from here to the center line here, let's deduct like, um, you know, a sixteenth of an inch, I suppose. And that would be your cylinder length. So this is one in 15 sixteenths. Uh, let's say that you're going to basically center that uh, in that area because the door will have a slight inset here. So um, seven eighths, uh, so 14. Let's see here now. That would be 28, 30 seconds. So maybe you're going to want to have that cylinder close to, um, you know, if we're putting it in the center, maybe 27, 30 seconds, something close to that. Meaning, you know, there is going to be no cylinder 27, 30 seconds. If here to the center here, just shy of that true center line, you're then going to figure out what mortise cylinder you're going to put here and then what collar you would put here. So that's pretty easy, simple, and straightforward. But the client that I was working on, their actual application was a very deep cased opening frame. And that door was actually, that was a three inch thick radiused door. And we were going to put that lock body right here. No problem. We're just going to need a really long cylinder. That's no problem. We can do that. Four and seven eighths length cylinder. Not a problem. That can be built. But the point of the matter is um, the STC product line allows us to solve problems. And I've spoken with the factory and you'll notice that there is not a double mechanical release at the um, 8125.87, uh, so just shy of um, 7 eighths back set. <clears throat> but I spoke to the factory, and they will make a double mechanical in this more narrow back set, should you need that. Um, so there you go, pretty neat, pretty neat stuff. Uh, so that dispels the part number. Let's go back to the top. <clears throat> Features a stainless steel bolt, 5 8 diameter. Uh, the bolt rotates freely, making attempts to tamper or uh, cut that. It just rotates. So if you're going to try to get in there and cut that, you have to be quite determined. 
Um, specification grade solenoid. Capable of superior overall performance. Okay, I'll have to take their word for it. I've never heard of anyone calling and saying their SDC solenoid failed. Um, not that a lightning bolt strike, you know, 100 feet away wouldn't, you know, kill that solenoid. <laughs> Uh, mechanical release, that is the in inherent uh, item we're talking about via mortise cylinder, one or both sides. Adjustable auto relock switch. The auto relock switch keeps the bolt retracted while the door is open. The door depresses the ball switch when the door closes. That will then allow the bolt to, uh, to retract. Okay. Uh, pardon me. That will allow the bolt to then project. So when you unlock the unit, it will stay, you unlock it, you pull the door open, it will stay retracted until that ball has, ball has been depressed, lock, uh, causing the bolt to project automatically, locking the door. In addition, the ball switch is bidirectional, permitting the lock to be used on swinging or sliding doors. Sure, absolutely. Um, not really sure how this lock is going to work on a sliding door. Um... You know what I mean? I'm not. I, I'm, I'm obviously missing something when it comes to a sliding door application for a bolt shape like this. Oh, if you're going to mount it in the header, yeah, forgive me. If you're mounting it up in the top of the door, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. That's where you would use that. Installation. You can mount the uh, in the jam or in the lock style. The stainless steel bolt projects at a right angle to the lock mechanism, allowing the ins installation of the space saver lock. That's the narrow back set by means of a simple cutout. That's true. It's an easy cutout. You can install it in any 1.75 inch frame, which means aluminum storefront is going to be in, you know, in play. Obviously, typical two inch hollow metal is in play as well. Or in door styles. With the entire lock concealed, aesthetic acceptability is complete. And that's one other thing this client wanted. Uh, very spartan in terms of what you can see in terms of hardware. Um, actually, we had discussed not having a cylinder on the outside. Um, but, you know, the ability to get in uh, with a key, I think, trumps the aesthetic concern. You still have to be able to get in. Uh, security is greater. Uh, installation in old or new construction is fast, easy, and economical. Security is greater because the hardware is concealed. Then on page two, we're going to get into um, this is a description of fail safe and fail secure. Fail safe is locked when energized, fail secure is unlocked when energized. Applications anywhere you like. Dimensional properties electrical characteristics. The bolt throw projection is 5 eighths of an inch on this. And then a breakdown of the part numbers that we just went over a moment ago. In this area here, the finish is here. We've got Y in our part number. 335, 335 black anodized. Options. So you can do a B option, which is a bolt status switch. Uh, that is going to report back to access control um, whether, whether or not that bolt is retracted or projected. You might want to have an audit trail over that. Um, if someone were to tamper the bolt and Lloyd the bolt or, or, you know, or know whether or not the bolt is retracted if someone has come and gone, um, you can report back to access control. Then you can do a D option, mechanical door position switch, that will tell you whether it's retracted or projected. Um, so what they're really driving at here is you can have access control auditing or, or knowing whether or not um, whether or not your bolt is thrown or retracted. The door position switch tell someone whether the door is closed or ajar okay because you can have the bolt thrown and the door ajar um, that that can be done so you can have monitoring over both of those aspects they're talking about you need generally an inch and one eighth uh, length cylinder the length of that cylinder will of course be determined on your application you might need something 
longer. As I said earlier, you might need something shorter um, for your application. And they're saying that you'll use a standard cam with that. Let's hop over to the template, which is here. Showing you the cutout, 10 and a half inch by, I believe it was inch and a half. There it is, inch and a half. Okay. This here shows how those mounting tabs are used. And assuming that the plate is going to be flush with the edge of the door, you know, yeah, we've got a backset problem. Frame preparation for the strike, four inch by, you know, just heavy on inch and a half. You're going to need a couple of uh, reinforcing tabs if you're doing a new installation for this. Very important uh, question is, okay, where do I put everything? Well, this is where it tells you where to put everything. Um, you've got from the top of the lock prep to the center of the bolt, seven and five eighths. You have, you know, that dimension is, is good to know, but what we're really driving at here is the center line of the faceplate okay is five and a quarter of on the lock body well three inch down is going to be the center line of the strike so you know the top of your door to the center line of your faceplate is going to be x dimension you're going to add to that um three inch if you're measuring on the frame, but you're going to add an eighth of an inch because we're assuming you'll have an eighth of an inch margin at the uh, below the underside of the header and the top of the door. So let's just say that the top of the door to the center of the strike was, you know, 44 inch. Um, you're going to deduct from that three and one eighth inch when you're measuring top of the door to the center line of the faceplate. It's a three inch relocation of center line minus the eighth of an inch because you're now measuring on the top of the door. That should put you in a real good, a real good position. Okay. Now the wiring, this is, you know, depending on your level of comfort with wiring and, and mine is, um, is I will, I would agree to ever improving, uh, but this is pretty simple and straightforward. The bottom line is, once you're familiar with it, it's simple and straightforward. The bottom line is you're going to, from your power supply, you're going to run a negative wire to the negative of your load, your your latch, your pardon me, your electric deadbolt. Depending on how you're going to power these, you're going to have to either do 20, 12 or 24 volt. And that was shown on the body, what wires you um, terminate together. So if you're running 24 volt, blue and black will be terminated together. Or you're going to terminate for 12 volt, red and black and blue and white together. So th those will be your two power uh, lines coming, you know, your, your, how you're going to power it, your positive and negative. Power supply to the negative of your load, your electric deadbolt in this case, will either be white or to blue white, blue and white. Then from there, the positive terminal off of the lock is going to go to the um, switch. So in this case, all they have is a simple button. And when you're doing fail secure, you would run that to the normally open option because the circuit is open. Uh, there's no power flowing through it because it's a, no, a fail secure strike. You're going to take the orange wire, that fifth wire, and you're going to combine it with your wire coming off the common and that both of those wires jumpered together will lead back to the positive in the power supply. I have a wiring diagram here that I did for uh, a test project and it's the same concept. This happens to be a keypad. Okay, so negative from the power supply to my negative my positive is going to go to normally open. My, 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 my keypad required 
power to it. So we've got extra wires here. But all I'm going to do is take my positive and my common and jumper them together and run them both back to positive. My power supply has two pair of positive and negative power terminals, which is why I broke that out. Otherwise, I would have jumpered this wire and this wire together and gone back to one terminal. Super easy. Right? I hope. If this was fail safe, you would run it to the normally closed. Um, pardon me, the normally closed is what it would be. Power would run continuously until you open the button to open the circuit to break the power to um, unlock the lock and fail safe is what that would be. Uh, and that's what the fifth wire is for. You're going to jumper that fifth wire to your positive, coming off your common, to the positive terminal on your power supply. This talks about those optional switches that are here, and these will go back to access control. And um, this client does not have this monitoring on this device, which is why there are only the five wires. Otherwise, you'd need more wires. Now, speaking of quantity of wires, you're going to need, I mean, how many conductors are you going to need to power this? Well, two is what you're going to need going to each side. You're going to want to run four, you're going to want to run an extra pair to everything. Now, if you get down into here, you're going to get into a 10-wire system real quick, If you're immediately, if you're doing both of these monitoring options, um, is how you would do that. Now, if you're never going to wire it, you know, if you're not going to use one of these throws on these form C or single pull double throw switches, you wouldn't really need all those wires, but it's going to be a 10-wire installation if you're... Um, and if you're using all the options, and if you, and it, and they're going to be 18 gauge wire for sure, um, you know because you're you know you're you're at a half an amp basically on 24 volts. Now there's a link below this video here to the manufacturer's page. You can click on that. You can pull up not only all of the SDC products that we sell by means of this horizontal navigation, but also a link to the manufacturer's website, as well as a link to the product catalog that's here. The website's the pretty straightforward way to get into their product line. You know, here, here are their products, just click products. We're doing electric deadbolts, here they are. And now, under, and now underneath electric deadbolts will be all of their options that you see here, okay? We're obviously right here Okay. But other items, more petite versions of this material, the 110, 210 series, um, fail safe, fail secure. Now you're getting the theme of this. Real petite way to lock a door, unlock a door. This client could have done the same thing, but I think we would have had to have talked more about you know, this relock. Um, we would have had to have studied how are we going to let the door know that the, let, let the electric bolt know that the door is closed in order to project again. Maybe with a timer. Um, something of that range. I don't know how this is being told to project or not project in terms of when it's relocking. We'd have to investigate that. How much time do we have to, uh, you know, when you unlock the bolt, when you unlock the bolt and open the door, how, you know, when when does the unit project back? I, I don't know what that is. I'd have to find out. But we will find out if you need this. We will find out. A door contact would obviously be the way to do that. But you know, if if you need a door contact, just get the ball relock. Okay. Although, it would make it a much more petite installation if you used a door position switch elsewhere. Um, you know what I mean? You may not want to run all of this into your installation, but something needs to tell the door that, something needs to tell the bolt that the door is in the closed position and ready to receive the bolt. So their, their website is pretty good. Uh, very good, in fact. Contact us. Um, really super helpful people that are here. Um, you know, especially when it comes to wiring. Now, one thing that I've done, which is only related to 
Rickson, pardon me, uh, SDC in a peripheral sense, is Rickson used to make a electromagnetic door holder, or electric deadbolt, I should say, forgive me. They discontinued these locks many, many years ago. What's unique about these, this series of locks from Rickson is that they were a really strange size. And I don't see the faceplate size here. Okay, I have a full catalog that's here. Um, I've gotten too far away from it. All right, here is our housing size. The plate is nine inch long, inch and three quarter wide. So an unusual size um, on this 401DR. Well, what I've done in the past for a client is I've had a, I've had Rockwood manufacture me custom plates, and then I've taken, I've ordered an SDC lock, pulled all the guts off, um, drilled and uh, had tapped the hole for the relock ball switch, and was able to take STC hardware with a custom eighth of an inch thick piece of stainless that's been drilled, uh, punched in a turret most likely, and then countersunk where necessary and attached all of that back to it. Obviously that's not UL rated anymore because of the modification, um, but all we've done is swap out the faceplate. Uh, so that's a great way to be able to rectify a problem because this client with his hollow metal frame, this client has a, my customer's customer has, you know, five foot by 10 foot doors and these frames are huge. Uh, you know, 10 10 openings that are set in masonry walls. There's no easy way to get up there and, and change the preparation and the header for this. Um, so coming up with a faceplate is, is the way that we've gone with that. So pretty simple and straightforward. All right, let's uh, wrap up this video on camera. In conclusion, really nice quality product. Uh, neat little, sweet little piece of hardware that allows you to, you know, very, um, I'm not gonna say covertly, install hardware, but do so in a concealed fashion, giving you a, uh, an adherence to that aesthetic that you might be looking for, concealed hardware, super nice. That does rotate freely. And then we're gonna find out about that back set and I'm gonna upload uh, the answer to the information down below. This is either right and the paperwork's wrong or this is wrong. Um, and it could just be that the blocks, these aluminum blocks that they've made, are just too too long that they machine them in, uh, incorrectly, that they needed to be an eighth of an inch smaller, reprepped, um, you know, not not a big deal. But the plates have to be removed. They have to be milled down an eighth of an inch smaller and then re mortised here on a router table for that. It would be easy theoretically to do, um, but. You know, we'll figure it out. We'll update the uh, profile. If there's any questions on the SDC uh, 1291 ADD MR1 or any other SDC product, please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you. As an epilogue to the end of this video, here's the project that our client is working on. And at this very initial stage, the client reached out to me saying, hey, I'm looking for hardware that, you know, is really concealed. What are my options? This is all going to be custom steel tube that's going to be cut, welded, the whole nine yards. Not difficult to conceptualize any of this. Um, actually, I don't recall the thickness of the door, but it's not, um, I don't believe it's standard. I think it's a two inch thick steel tube. Um, so this is this was the client's original criteria. I had request or suggested to the client some different options. An electric strike obviously would do it with a lock, just in the phase of trying to figure out what the client wanted to do, electric strikes. The client didn't end up loving that because of how large these pieces of hardware are in the frame. And I think also the fabricator who, um, I think was maxed out in terms of their understanding of how we need shop drawings of the door and frame to really understand what the construction would look like. Um, we. The client and I elected that the strike might just be too large. 
A mortise lock was in play for a little bit. Um, the client elected to go with something with less obvious trim. Um, I toss this into the mix because I'll throw our SDC lock in every time I can. And that's because it meets the criteria of it being basically concealed. We then started to talk about how the client might hang the door in a concealed fashion because the uh, shop drawings uh, from the gate manufacturer showed very heavy, you know, surface mounted hinges, which I thought were a little inelegant uh, for the concealed look. The sauce hinges would absolutely handle the weight, but ultimately it was decided against because it was outside of the skill set of the uh, fabricator. Going with a lock uh, in the door itself, it was then discussed, how are we going to get power to the unit? Um, lots of conversation about that. Um, I did, thankfully, um, at the end of all of that, convince the client, he, you know, he was uh, not getting the sort of support from the fabricator necessary. The fabricator said, yeah, we'll drill a hole and you can just run the wire and put some molding over it. No, that's not what we're doing. We need concealed and elegant. Um, ultimately, we went with this command access telescoping flexible conduit solution uh, that will allow that low voltage to pass through here. So thankfully, um, we're able to get a elegant solution in play there for that. Okay. Next up on the list was to decide on some pull handles. And the client still hasn't come up with a pull handle, but Rockwood manufactures scores of options um, when it comes to pull handles. So this our client has this book to help him determine what he might like to have on that door. Now the client um, was very much entertaining the idea of not having a thumb turn on the inside and I discouraged that because there's no way to get out unless you have power through that door. Um, if, if you have power and you hit your button or your smartphone and, and retract the, the deadbolt, you're fine. But to completely avoid the inclusion of a thumb turn, a mechanical override, um, I, I disagreed with. And I sent the client a passage out of NFPA 101. Um, no door in any means of escape shall be locked against egress when the building is occupied. Now, occupied in a residential occupancy, I'm not sure what that number is. Um, like in a certain type of, it's either mercantile or business, whatever the occupancy is. Like, if there was 10 people in the building, you have occupancy. All locking devices that impede or prohibit egress or that cannot be easily disengaged shall, shall be prohibited. I sent this to the client saying, if you're not providing yourself a mechanical means by which to get out, even though you have other ways to get out, I think that's an awful idea. And it was, um, we are definitely shipping the client thumb turns. And at this stage of the game, we are now just shipping the hardware to the client, and we have our locks, our mortise cylinders, our thumb turns, and our telescoping conduits for passing low voltage. Thank you for going through this epilogue with me. Again, thank you for watching, and if you've enjoyed this video, please click thumbs up. Please subscribe and maybe even send the video to someone that you know. Thank you.